the purpose of talking today is to think about how these questions are actually being created and what that demonstrates about the principles on which they're testing you. Because if you understand how the testing board thinks, then it gives you an advantage as you study because you realize quickly that there are some things that are very amenable to questions and there are some topics that simply are too difficult to ask a question about. Okay, so now over the time that I've been doing this, I have found that the passing score has risen consistently. It's gone from 170 to 194 at the current time. And as international medical graduates, of course, you're going to want to do significantly better than that simple passing score. Um, to pass is one thing, but to get into the residency that you truly want, you're going to need a significantly higher level than that. The other thing that has happened is that the number of questions per block has gone down from 48 per block down now to being 40 per block in step one. And at the step two level, they say that they will have a minimum of 30 questions per block. And both of those trends, I think, will continue. The passing score will continue to rise as they refine this exam process. And the number of questions per block will continue to fall. But if you think about what that means, it reflects the fact that their questions are becoming more and more complex. They're moving from questions, the old style of questions, where I refer to them jokingly as factoid questions. In other words, very simple, one step, asking about a fact that you either know and get the question right or you don't know and get the question wrong. Okay? They moved then up until relatively recently into what I call vignettes, which are short case histories. They tend to include most of the information that you would want to see. And so the first step would be to make a diagnosis of the patient. And then they'll ask you something about how that disease process occurs. Okay, so different styles of questions following a very short paragraph long um, short history. What they've gotten into now are the case studies, which are a much more involved process. And this, of course, involves you needing to read more. So they have to give you more time in order to digest the information, to make logical stepwise thought progressions, and then to answer any question that follows that particular case study. Okay? So keep in mind that as I show you this sequence, there will still be questions of most of the types that I show you here on this presentation. It would be true that you might see questions of the types of all of them that I will show you, but the trend has been toward the replacement questions that come in every year are tending to be more and more of the complex style. So the ones that I show you earliest on are questions that honestly, I tell my students, if you see a question like this next one, what you're going to do is you're going to be in the Prometric Center and you're going to very quickly sing happy birthday to me. You're going to answer the question and move on. Because the chances of that style of question recurring is going to be diminishingly small. So the reason why I call this an evolution sequence is that you should think of it as moving toward the more complex questions. And we feel as though there was a sort of quantum shift about three or four years ago when the scales truly tipped toward virtually all of the questions that people see being in the higher level of evolution rather than the earlier one. But I still think it's instructive to look at all of them. So here comes a question that I would call a factoid question. Okay, if you notice, it has a one-line lead-in, 
Which of the following is the most common cause of infectious mononucleosis in the United States? And then a list of agents of disease, A through E. Now, the purpose of this discussion this, this afternoon and evening for you guys is not to test you on whether or not you could pick the correct answer, which of course would be Epstein-Barr virus, but to point out to you every single question in this pile that I'm going to show you is about Epstein-Barr virus. So I'm trying to take that out of our discussion. I know all of you are frantically looking for a way to vote for Epstein-Barr virus, or you're typing it into the chat box, but I just want you to save your energy and concentrate on the style of the question here. And if you notice, you either know this or you don't. If I knew that the most common cause of, of mononucleosis in the U.S. was Epstein-Barr virus, i pick that. Notice all the options are alphabetized. They are given in alphabetical order, so I can find it very quickly, even if they gave me a longer list. Well, that was fairly quickly supplanted by the questions that moved into the vignette style. And I would have to say to you that most of the time that I've been teaching toward this exam, this has been the beginning of the, um, the situation that I've been seeing. So if you notice, again, taking out the frantic search for a correct answer, you're going to read the question, a 21-year-old male college student who reports sore throat and extreme fatigue following even taxing, non, even non-taxing tasks, like getting dressed and going down to breakfast. He tells you that he has been sick for several weeks and that he has been feverish and his girlfriend now appears to be getting the same thing. His tonsils are inflamed with a white exudated hearing. Cervical lymphadenopathy is prominent as is splenomegaly. What's the most likely causal agent? Okay. So notice, in a paragraph-long reading, you can quickly pick out the patient, their chief complaint, and think about what is the most likely cause, which again, as you already know, is always going to be Epstein-Barr virus in this particular scenario. It's a little bit more complex. They're patient-centering it so that you have to make that diagnosis, but still, this is another style of question that if I saw it on my exam day, I would be singing happy birthday to me before I moved on. This is really quite simple compared to what you will face on exam day. Now the next iteration, I'm not even going to read this vignette to you because it's exactly the same. But they began to dig more deeply into the problem now. And if you notice in this list of options following that same stem, I now have A through K possibilities. Okay? A through K is a lot of chances to guess wrong. So if you think about their strategy here, what they are trying to do is make it so that a student who is wildly guessing answers is simply not going to get the point here, okay? They don't want you guessing what is the most common cause of infectious mononucleosis in the United States. They want you to know it. And they furthermore feel that it is important for you to know what the style and life cycle of the agent is. So if you notice, this looks incredibly complex. And of course, I can't see you out there in India, and I can't hear you moaning in front of your computers, but I've done enough of this in a live classroom that I know the universal response to questions like this is to cry if it's before lunch and to throw up if it's after lunch. It's one of these visually overwhelming lists of possibilities that you just go, oh my goodness, I can't possibly do this. I'm exhausted. I don't even want to look at this list. I hate these people and I'm moving on. Well, keep in mind, this is no more difficult truly than the last question that simply had the agents of disease in the list. And there are a small number of things that you have to think about here so I always tell my students, when you see a question 
with this number of different possibilities, A through K, they say they'll even go up to Z now if they feel like it. Okay? So you cannot allow them to psychologically get inside your head over this. You have to say to yourself, I know this, deep breath, and then go back to the stem and solve the problem. So for me, the first thing that I would do with this question is I would remind myself that Epstein-Barr virus is a herpes family virus. Because when I have that in my mind, I can now begin to subcategorize those things that I need to know. Herpes, if you recall, is a DNA virus. Okay, so I know one of the points in their horrifying list already. I also remember that it's quite important to know that herpes has a nuclear membrane envelope. Now, knowing that a virus has an envelope tells the physician something about how that virus is likely to be transmitted. Because envelopes, as an outer covering, are something that make a virus rather fragile. If I have a virus that has a naked capsid, that has a protein shell and it doesn't have a membrane around it. So I can much more easily destroy a virus that has a, an, a membrane around it because then I simply need to use something like a detergent or a phenol, something like that, to disinfect an area. And most viruses that have a membranous covering are not transmitted in a fecal oral fashion because viruses who get across your gastric acidity have to be able to tolerate acid, and if I've got an envelope, I'm not going to be very good at doing that, okay? Now, beyond that, I frankly believe that the knowledge of whether the shape of a virus is icosahedral or helical is pretty unimportant. And one of the things I always try to teach my students as they're studying, and this may sound irreverent if you'll forgive me, but I always say to my students, make me care. Because there is so much in medicine that you have been forced to memorize so far that in reality is not going to make a difference to how good a physician you are. Okay? So in the case of the choice between icosahedral and helical, I would say to you, I think that's so minor that I think the today's exam questions are not going to emphasize that. And I'll show you a question at the end of the sequence that will demonstrate that. But for now, it is an icosahedral family. All of the DNA viruses are icosahedral with one exception, and that would be pox. So notice that I've gotten the three points from their list. Now, the key step is that as you do this, I want you to write this down on the dry erase board that they give you in the Prometric Center. And the purpose of doing that is not just to waste your time. It's to make certain that now, when you go to the list, you can very quickly go to the option that you have uh, logically worked through in your own ed, find that answer, and move on. So if you notice, these truly are not that difficult. They're designed to be visually overwhelming. And you have to make certain that you're prepared when you see these things to take a deep breath and just handle them very carefully with your own logic. Okay. Now, the early 2000s involved the same process moving forward somewhat to move into issues of greater clinical thought processing. So notice, starting again with exactly the same stem, so I'm not going to read it to you, they had reached the point now where in computer programs, they could be assured that they could reproduce images in such a way that people taking their exam in Bangladesh we're seeing the same image as those seeing it in Wisconsin in the United States. 
So the computer materials had gotten good enough that they were able to start putting images in. And there was quite a wild proliferation of questions that had images. Now, in my experience, the images are ancillary to the description of the patient in the stem. But nonetheless, they can be very beneficial if you know them. And if you don't know them, you can still usually solve the problem simply by thinking your way through it. Now, if you notice, the only difference between this stem and the last one I showed you is the fact that they're showing you a blood film. And that blood film asking you what is the cell at the arrow requires you, first of all, I hope, to recognize that the cell at the arrow is not a red blood cell, it's a white blood cell. And so now, because it's a very unusually shaped white blood cell, I'm now in the position where I have to figure out what that is. And I'm not going to be able to do it purely from the image. I'm going to have to think my way through the pathophysiology of the disease. So notice the stepwise progression here. First of all, I'm going to make the diagnosis, which is based on the description of the patient, as we've been doing all along. Then I'm going to know that from Epstein-Barr virus, the cells that predominate in the circulation are not my infected cells. My infected cells are my B lymphocytes, right? Because Epstein-Barr virus attaches to CD21, and CD21 is found on nasopharyngeal epithelial cells and on B lymphocytes. Why should you care about that? Because realize those are the cells that be can become malignantly transformed as a sequela of this acute infection. Nasopharyngeal cancer, B cell lymphomas are what I see predominating in the sequela of Epstein-Barr virus. But realize, even though the greatest majority of students would very quickly make the erroneous assumption that what is found in the blood film are the infected B cells, that is not the case. The pathophysiology of this disease is such that my lymphadenopathy and my splenomegaly are resulting from the infected B lymphocytes. But what I have circulating in the blood is my killer T cells. Now, notice that that requires a level of understanding of the pathophysiology of the disease that you might not have fully grasped if you had just learned everything you needed to know about Epstein-Barr virus from a textbook that you were reading page by page. So one of the critical things about today's exam that you always have to think about, make certain you are studying to ask yourself the question, why does my patient look the way my patient does? Because that particular answer is going to be much more likely to be somewhere in the spectrum of what they're actually going to ask you. So this in the picture, this atypical lymphocyte is a cytotoxic T cell, okay? Now, moving on, the next iteration took exactly the same thing, exactly the same picture. I won't belabor you with that process so far. And then take a deep breath and try not to cry. But the question becomes, if I were to use the flow cytometer as a diagnostic, what would the cell that had been in that picture be wearing on its surface membrane? Okay, once again, notice we now have L possibilities, not just K, but through the whole way to L. Oh my God, even Chester is over here crying. But the point is, again, this is not difficult. There's one additional step. If you remember, at the last point, I got to the place 
where I knew that that was a cytotoxic T cell. So now the only additional step is to say to myself, cytotoxic T cells wear molecules of CD3 and CD8 on their surface. They have both of those on their surface. So when I read the results of what a flow cytometer will put out in its reading, I have to now take the final step of reading the graph in order to evaluate the correct answer. And so notice it is my initial graph, A, that has CD3 and CD8 included. So right off, I know I'm in that graph. And a cell that has both in high intensity is going to be both high on the x-axis and the y. So far to the right and toward the top. And the cells who fit that criterion are the dots in the upper right quadrant because they're far to the right and they're close to the top. So they're wearing high amounts of both CD3 and CD8, okay? So my answer then, once I've evaluated that, becomes quadrant two of graph A, and I'm done. Once again, not that complex, but let's stop for a moment and think about the fact that this question is at least a four-step question. I have to make the diagnosis from the vignette. I then have to um, know, uh, identify the cells in the image, thinking through the pathophysiology, recognize that they're cytotoxic T cells. I then have to know what markers they have on their surface, and then I have to be able to read the graph. That is a very complex intellectual process, and notice, I can't have memorized my way through that. I have to make that stepwise progression in my mind. It's not something I'm going to read out of a textbook. I have to use the information that I've memorized in order to get to that point. And does anybody know how many points I get for answering that four-step process correctly? Well, we're not yet going to open up the chat box. Chirag is going to be in charge of that in a moment. But if, if you know this exam, you realize that this gets you only one point. Do you see why the number of questions per block has been going down? It's because they are requiring much more of you than simple memorization and knee-jerk responses. Okay. All right, well, hang on, because here we are at the style of question that actually predominates on today's exam, okay? Now, we call these case histories or case studies, whichever you'd like to do. But if you'll notice, the stem now is going to be significantly longer just to start with, okay? A 21-year-old college student presents to the student health clinic complaining that he has, quote, the sorest throat of his life, and is tired all the time. He has been sexually active for the past several months with multiple partners. On examination, the patient has a temperature of 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit, or 38 degrees centigrade. His oropharynx shows a white exudate and marked enlargement of the tonsils. He has enlargement of his posterior cervical lymph nodes. His abdomen is soft with a palpable splenic tip. His liver is mildly enlarged and tender to palpation. Routine blood tests are ordered and are shown. Okay, now I'm going to come to those in a second. But notice now that what they're asking you to do is to start with the patient and think your way very clearly through the process. So we refer to this as a patient-centered style of thinking, okay? And what we recommend first is to ask yourself, who just walked in the door in my office? Who is this individual? 
Now, this may sound like profiling, and that's sort of a bad word in the United States right now, meaning that I am making a snap judgment on looking at my patient and evaluating what I think they, they have. But remember in medicine, this is a critical thing to do. I have to think about the age of the patient, I have to think about their gender, and I have to think about the length of time that they have had the problem that they're complaining of. Because if I'm not doing that, I run the risk of wasting my time trying to diagnose some condition that has no possibility of being the likely cause in this individual. For example, if I were to go just off the wall in crazy, if I had a 50-year-old man in my office and I was running pregnancy tests on him, that would be a pretty foolish waste of my time, right? So when a patient is with you, you are making judgments about what the most likely things are that could be happening to them with their gender and the time frame they're describing as the most likely cause of their complaint, okay? So notice that in this STEM, it was a 21-year-old college student. We learn a little bit down the line that it's a male, okay? And when you think about that, you realize that that is sort of in an age group where I would assume that my patient is likely to have some sort of inflammatory or reactive problem based on something that he has been doing in his life. It's outside of the age group for which I would anticipate seeing things that are either genetic or developmental, because in most cases, those will show up before the age of 20, okay? If I have an older individual, then realize I start thinking about the neoplastic and degenerative problems as they approach their 60s, okay? And it's not an absolute. You know very well that I can have cancers in children and I can have, degener I can have degenerative problems earlier than 60. But as a general rule, that allows me to think about the processes that sort of float to the top of the list of possibilities in this patient. So I'm right in that age group now where I'm thinking of something inflammatory or reactive. Okay? Now, if you notice the next step in the...